Um, and let's get started. I think the numbers are, are finally stabilized. So my name is Lori Conlon. I run the postdoc office and the Career Services Center within the Office of Intramural Training and Education. And this session today is a little bit of an introduction on careers and industry, both research focused, non-research focused, supporting the science, business development, all kinds of fun things. So we're gonna talk um, uh, about all these different options, kind of think about how to strategize your day here at the Career Symposium, and just in general, kind of think about how biomedical sciences, scientists with PhDs or higher degrees um, kind of integrate themselves into an industry environment. Of course, you all know this is part of our NIH career symposium. I know you know that because you got here and that's the only way you could find the link. Um, these slides are already available for you within the Whova website. Just go under the agenda into this session and you can pick those up. Um, the community boards are, are, are so much fun. I know I showed yesterday that I, I love the, the pets board. Um, and I'm seeing a lot more um, coffee meetups and things like that happening. And that does me a delight. Uh, we're actually going to host one about science in the intramural research program, um, how to find PIs, et cetera, postdocs, et cetera. Um, that'll be tomorrow, I think, at 1030 in the morning, and real casual. Don't worry about it. We'll be done by 11 o'clock for the next session but look for that within the community tab over here in the Whova app. All right, so let's talk about industry. All right, let's, this is a really fun talk for me to do. It's one that I, I love. Um, my PhD is in biochemistry and biophysics. I have a lot of friends who after we finished our grad school or our postdoc did go off into industry positions, both um, research focused and research adjacent. Um, I don't like to say bench and non-bench because some of you don't do bench work. So research focused and research adjacent. And industry is such a large component of where scientists go off and get jobs. And I thought, let's talk a little bit about what's there and what's different and what's not. So Industry jobs, if you're going research-based industry jobs, R&D, um, they're going to look very, very similar uh, to what you're already doing as a researcher. Um, it's gonna look the same, it's gonna smell the same. It's really funny, a couple of years ago, I went and toured MedImmune, which is now AstraZeneca here locally in the DC area. And um, I went with a bunch of, of trainees and it was really kind of one of the first times in a long time I had gone into an industry research environment. And I had this perception of industry in my head that it was um, <laughs> all gold plated, phenomenal fancy, and everything was brand new and shiny, right? Because it's industry and they have the money to just go like this, right? <laughs> And then I go through their research labs and they look exactly like my bench, right? It's a mess. There's a, um, a, a Kyogen kit from 1973 <laughs> up there on the top, right? And so it just looks a lot like what it does in academics, but there are some differences. One that's not even on my list is, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> is um, documentation. Uh, is if you're research focused, documenting what you're doing is very, very different. You really have to not only say your notebook, no more shoving the paper towels in the middle of your notebook, right? With the gels that are halfway labeled. Everything has to be documented and documented really well. They work a lot in matrix teams within industry. So while you might be um, R&D, you will have somebody on your, on your matrix team who perhaps is from marketing, perhaps somebody who is from um, operations, somebody from the uh, production line, et cetera. So you're gonna have lots of different people that work within those matrix teams to kind of make sure that the product finally goes off to market. They're very deadline driven. Um, much more so, and they won't bang their heads against the wall trying to get something to work because they're results driven because time is money. Again, they're money driven, right? We all know that. Then we're not telling you anything that most of you don't know. They are very money driven. 
because the goal of a company is to make money. And so you want to find a company that really fits your mission. You follow between the missions of the two of you and that organization. They're resource rich. Okay. So you'll be able to, to probably do any type of science that you need to, and they will protect their intellectual property. Now, interestingly, a couple of years ago, I did this really interesting study about publishing in industry, right? A lot of people say, oh, if I go to industry, I can't publish. A couple of years ago, there was a law, po law done by um, Congress called the Sunshine Law or something like that. And when that came through, it made it more difficult for industry to talk directly to physicians and things like that. So they changed their communication model into a lot of publications within journals that we all love and know. So you can still like one time again, MedImmune, that's our local one. It makes it easy for me to kind of look at it. I looked to see how much they had published within two month period and it was outpacing. It was like, like 30 or 40 articles were published within that time. So you can still publish even in an industry environment. Okay, remember any questions you have, pop them in the Q&A, the transcript is available, slides are in Whova. All right, so let's talk about how industry is kind of segregated. Um, the first thing you need to know is, when you're thinking about industries, what's actually out there? So there are pharmaceutical companies, right? Including the generics companies that exist as things go off their patents. So pharmaceutical companies, the big ones um, are typically like Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, et cetera. There used to be a very large distinction between pharma and biotech, okay? Very large distinction between pharma and biotech um, where biotech um, was more of the biologics and pharma historically was more of um, the small molecules. But over the years, I would say over the last 10 years, it's really collapsed where pharma and biotech are really just about the same thing, indistinguishable. There's also scientific supply companies and they hire PhDs. Think of like BioRed, Kyogen, New England Bio Labs, et cetera. Medical devices and diagnostics, um, service providers, so contract research organizations, folks who help with regulatory affairs, marketing, analytics, et cetera. Then there's the people that fund um, venture cap and investors um, and any nonprofits and NGOs that kind of straddle this industry border, okay? So there's kind of the kind of broad picture of um, the types of organizations that hire folks like us. And then the second is, how big are those organizations, right? So there's the mega companies, right? Lots and lots of revenue, lots of employees, all the way down here to those early stage startups, which are looking on, you know, working on venture cap funding. Um, they may eventually get sold off to one of the larger companies, um, but they're really like spin outs typically of academic research um, that are kind of getting going before a company, well, a larger company, anyone from small to mega, start buying them up because their technology is so amazing. Think, for example, uh, cancer immunotherapy, how many spin outs there's been out of uh, academics. And then now those large companies are kind of taking those over. And this is just kind of a matrix um, of the different types of companies based on the size. So when we're thinking about pharmaceutical and biotech companies that are humongo, mega, right? That's the Pfizer's, the GSK's, um, the Amgen's and AstraZeneca. Thinking about those that are larger, um, probably Teva, uh, Boehringer Ingelheim, Celgene, et cetera. This slide needs to be updated, sorry. Mid-size, small, and then you know, the ones that are coming up. Device companies are kind of weird. Johnson & Johnson kind of you know, straddles all of it, right? They make Band-Aids and toothpaste, but they also make drugs. Um, so J&J, &J, um, Baxter uh, is a large device-based company. You guys know most of these types of companies. Um, you either use them, you see the commercials for them, whatever um, that you're thinking about. So this is just to kind of give you an idea of how things kind of are sliced and diced within the industry environment. This book by Toby Friedman, um, uh, Careers in Pharmaceutical and Biotech, and I have it in a couple of slides. This is one of the best books that I have seen out there about career opportunities in the life sciences. 
And I think when many of us look at pondering a career in industry, we really think about this circled part, right? Discovery research, preclinical research, and product development. Those are those research-centric positions looking like what you're doing right now. But industry jobs for biomedical scientists are so much broader. They include this entire spectrum from project management, clinical science, regulatory affairs, you know, someone has to get that IND back off to FDA, medical affairs, uh, marketing and sales. So it's all the way to law and recruiting and management consulting. So the career options in industry are so wide and so varied that you have the opportunity to really think about where your skills, your interests, and your values really fit into the various jobs that are out there. Okay, so a little bit of that. The really cool thing about this book, and again, I have it in a couple of slides, is again, we think about research and development as that's what industry is. And the book is about this thick and the career options for research and development are about that thick. And so there's, it just gives you this encompassing um, opportunities um, in, in biotech and pharma and, and companies. All right, but let's, many of you are probably thinking first of careers in research and development. So that's things such as discovery, right? Pre-discovery research, very much um, on the very front end, could be very basic science-y type of stuff. Uh, technologies, instrument, medical devices, all of them have this discovery base. Um, the pre-clinical is kind of has, it starts to head out of the discovery phase really thinking about how to capitalize on those drug targets, those candidates, that, that thing's going to make us money down the road. That's that preclinical. And then clinical is obviously, once it starts heading off into efficacy and safety trials before we're going to hop it off to the IND. Um, I think many of us, after the COVID vaccines have gone, gone so, um, so well over the past couple of years, that we, we see this, we know what this looks like a little bit more than we would have perhaps a year or two years ago. And then at the last part of this is, it's all fine and dandy to grow that whatever it is in a, you know, in a beaker this big, but how are you gonna make 300 or 400 liters of it? How are you going to make it on a scale that's sellable? Um, so that is uh, product development. So, Later on today at 11 o'clock, these are the speakers that are coming for R&D type jobs. And you can see they're from all different types and sizes, mega companies, biotech, pharma, um, all the way from Janssen, who my friend Sarah Aubert from grad school. Uh, Gail's actually here, she's gonna come. She's coming from France today. Um, Tom Paul, he used to, he was here for years. He works at Pfizer. So some of the larger companies, Albert Sec. And then there's some, you know, Thermo Fisher. So we have somebody who is at the device um, or, or the scientific supply type companies. So you'll have the ability to meet with lots and lots of different people um, in the next session. When I think about what makes you competitive for a career in these positions, um, absolutely your research experience is important, right? You have to be able to match at least 80% of that job ad that's out there. Um, another one is that's often common here is they, you know, it says five years of industry experience, Psh, right, apply anyways, right? <laughs> apply anyways, uh, see what happens, right? As long as your research is fairly close. Um, a lot of people ask me, uh, do I need a postdoc in order to get a job in industry? Nope, not necessarily. As long as you're building your network and you have the skills in order to make that, that leap into research and development, any, actually any job in industry, you don't necessarily need a postdoc. That said, one of the hard parts about being a PhD student is you don't ever really know when your defense date is. Uh, mine got postponed for a year. Right. And so like navigating that timeline can be a little bit challenging. Um, so that's why a lot of people will take a postdoc, even if it's short, just as that buffer zone, not because you need it, but it's that buffer zone um, as you kind of move on. The next question is, when do you think about taking a position in industry? Um, it how long have you like everyone says, how long is it too long? Mm, not really. There is a distinct couple of time zones though. 
The first is less than two to three years. So if, for example, you've gone into your postdoc and you've been there for two, maybe three years. For the most part, they're not going to care if you have a publication or not at that lower, at that, that, that small time frame. If you're a chemist, that's different. You need the publications in chemistry. But for most of you who are in the bio, biomedical sciences, in two to three years, most of us don't have a publication at that amount of time. And they're okay with that. It's perfectly fine. The challenge is, is the longer you stay, the more important at least getting one publication out is. It is your currency of success. So the longer you stay in that particular um, position, the more important the publication becomes to show that you can complete a project. You definitely want to show them some team skills and some collaboration skills. So um, not just pipetting all day, they want to see, can you be a good coworker and can you work on those matrix teams that we talked about and they really want to see someone who has initiative and independence. That's something that we heard a lot from our speakers um, um, about uh, quality candidates coming into their unit. So how do you prepare for that? How do you get better? So for your research, make sure you're doing awesome science. Absolutely, right? Craft your message for your resume. And we have lots of, I'll, I'll show you a couple things um, next in the next slide. Make sure your resume is, is crafted towards that job so that you make it, dead easy for a hiring manager to see why they should call you for an interview. I also do highly recommend you understand the drug, the, the, the industry process, right? Industry science. So if you are an intramural research fellow, you should really be taking advantage of our translational science training program. It happens about twice a year. If you're not in the NIH intramural research program, you should look at your home institution to see what they're doing to prepare you for careers in industry. You should have team and collaboration skills. You should lead a collaboration, right? So it's not just enough to say you clone by phone, right? You need to be able to say, I organized different people. I got the paper out under, uh, on time, under budget, those kind of things. Finding times to mentor younger trainees is, so very, is a great opportunity to show your supervisory experience. Serving on committees shows that you have the ability to do things besides just research all day long. And I really, one of the things we've really noticed um, with our industry folks is that people who are taking time to understand themselves and how to deal with others, management skills, um, such as if you're at the NIH, um, our, our uh, workplace dynamic series, in fact, that's open to everyone. It won't start up again till the fall. Um, so don't look for it now, but the Workplace dynamic Series. And for those of you at the NIH, we have a management course. So you should look at management courses to kind of tell them that you understand how to lead people, motivate people, deal with conflict, um, you know, build teams, et cetera. And then one way to show initiation and independence is have stories ready about how you sold your PI on a particular area um, or an idea. So we, I'm going to switch a little bit and then I'm going to give you a whole bunch of resources on resumes and cover letters and all the rest of that stuff. We don't have time for that today, but let's talk um, about non-research careers in industry, which is our second session of today in the noonish time zone. Field application scientists. These are folks who provide technical support to their customers. These are the folks that come in and help you understand how to use the confocal microscope, how to use this piece of software, um, why this particular DNA prep is the best one out there. They're typically folks who have a scientist background. And so it's a scientist to scientist conversation. It goes so much better than if it's just someone who does sales. Medical science liaison medical, um, and medical affairs slash communication are really looking to build relationships with physicians to help them understand how to use particular products effectively, um, understand the, the science behind it, um, and really think about how to join the research and the medical community. Strategy and consultants, so this is like the McKinsey's of life, et cetera, McKinsey's, Booz Allen, Hamilton, we don't have a ton of speakers about that today. Um, they have two different things. Um, most of the time, consultants and strategy are not really doing, um, uh, there is folks who do do technical, scientific consulting, but they're not typically people who have come directly out of a postdoc or a PhD. That's something for later. Most PhD, most 
new people who are looking to move into the consulting realm are likely going into strategic consulting. That's the McKinsey's, the Booz Allen. You may or may not be within a scientific um, company. Your job though, is to help whoever's hired you to understand how to do, do things better. And they hire us as PhDs in higher level degrees because we think really clearly and we solve problems quickly. And then regulatory affairs um, from the industry side of the house, right? Really preparing the drug, the, in, um, the investigative new drug portfolios that are going to be submitted over to the FDA. And we have speakers in about all of this. A couple of people are um, international, but they're placed into different places. So the field application scientists and tech support people from lots of different companies. Um, we have some strategy consultants and program management. I didn't think about, didn't mention that one. Program management um, is a career project program or project management. It's a career where you are helping to organize those matrix teams, making sure that things are done on time, on budget, and within resources. So trying to make sure that um, my friend who um, did this for, it's for a video game company, but um, he calls himself the nerd wrangler, right? The nerd wrangler. <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. Um, clinical science support careers. Um, unfortunately, Mawada is not going to be here today, but she said you can connect with her later. Um, these are folks who have, uh, these are all PhD, yeah, all PhD level people who work on that interface um, between the, ba the, the, the research and development side of the house and the clinical trial side of the house. So moving things into the clinical trial. Uh, medical science liaison, medical affairs, medical writing, and regulatory affairs. So we have all of these speakers coming at the 110 to 210 timeframe. I know that one's like a hard one to choose which one you're going to go to, right? Sorry, not sorry. To be competitive for these types of positions, you really need to learn how to communicate your science. This is the hugest part for all of these careers. How do you discuss your science and how do you discuss your success? You may or may not need publications for this type of job. It really depends on the organization. And that's a really good question to ask all the speakers at the next session. You know, how important are publications to get a job like yours? Team and collaboration skills and initiative and independence are still there. I think I want to really point out for this particular component, it's a lot the same as we talked, but serving on committees is so very important to these types of jobs because your job will be to make sure that you can organize lots of different things. So serving on committees such as um, the on FELCOM or FELCOM, your postdoc association, uh, subcommittees. In fact, if you are a um, intramural research fellow, there's FELCOM and the career development subcommittee of FELCOM both have meetups coming up. So you may want to pop into those and see how you can get involved. Find your own local postdoc association or grad student council. Get involved because that is what makes you a competitive candidate for this particular type of job, as well as writing skills. Write, 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 write. Just continue to write, especially non-technical writing. We're going to move in then to the more business part of science, business development, really kind of, you know, making sure that you can build the deals um, between either academics and industry or industry to industry to start moving technology and patents and things between those people. Programs and operation management. Sorry, I talked about this one already, but it looks like it's in the session above. And then patents and tech transfers. Um, really thinking about how do we protect intellectual property of investors, companies, et cetera. So whether that is from the academic side of the house the industry side of the house, et cetera. So there's people who are attorneys who, 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 who do the, do the, the law-based work, folks in, in different company organizations that do the technology transfer to get it over to the attorneys, to get it over to the U.S. Patent and Trade Organization. Okay, so these um, business development, you know, that cell, there's two speakers there. We have two speakers coming at 220 about technology transfer. We have some people who do program management. Patent law, oh man, Ooh, 
Ooh, that's a lot of money. Um, patent law and also a patent agent. So um, she's unfortunately not on this slide, but we also have a patent agent coming. So patent law is folks who have gone off and got their, their JD degree. Patent agents are adjacent. They work together. They don't have the law degree. They both um, work within law firms typically. And then there's the US Patent and Trademark Office is coming today, Julie and Emily. I do warn you though, if you are a non-citizen, don't go to that session. Um, the US Patent and Trade Organization, it's a government agency and they will only hire citizens. They don't even have contractors as far as I know. So to be competitive for these types of positions, again, it's communicating your research. It's almost all the same. I think the difference here is really you have to understand how a drug gets to market. And so really doing those coursework on how a drug gets to market or doing the research on that. You also may need um, some coursework in this particular case, whether that is um, a whole, whole groupings on um, what is tech transfer, what is regulatory affairs, some very basic business. There's a really good um, community board on the Whova board going about, should I get an MBA or not? And basically everyone's telling you no. Um, but a course in business, like a business 101, wouldn't be a horrible idea, okay? Um, you can look at F your local institution. I know many um, postdoc offices have access to these types of, of courses, um, but uh, you can also check FAES. I, and I think many of their things, and that's the foundation, that's local FAES.org. Um, I think that most of their things are still virtual and you don't have to be an nih -er to take their courses. And they have phenomenal courses in things such as tech transfer regulatory affairs. I have some honorable mentions of careers I didn't talk about today, uh, operations and quality control and quality assurance, and also finance. Unfortunately, we don't have any speakers today about finance, but think about like all the hedge funds out there, um, anything, you know, any of the larger corporate organizations, um, somebody with a PhD or somebody who knows science has to evaluate that science to know whether or not we should invest in that science. Um, so finance also has a large, large place for PhDs. So this is Lori's if then statements and I've created these and they're not perfect, but that's okay, right? You'll smile and nod. If you like bench work, right? If you like the research side of the house, look at R&D, manufacturing, et cetera. If you love details, you know, you are good about the details, look at regulatory affairs, tech transfer, clinical trials, et cetera. If you like finance, you know, you, you follow the money, uh, business development and finance. Do you love to organize things? Like literally that is like my favorite thing in life, right? That's why you have a career symposium is because I love to organize things. Um, program management, project management, clinical trial management. If you like to influence people, business development, as well as consulting um, and program management. Uh, if you love seeing the coolest, newest, hottest technology that's out there, um, business development, tech transfer, and IP law. Part, oh, we didn't even talk about marketing today, um, but if you like being creative and being creative with a science slant, marketing might be a place. Writing and speaking about science, sales, tech transfer, medical science liaison, et cetera. And here's two good books. This is, they're very old. I wish somebody would redo these, but they haven't. Um, but this is my fave, okay? Toby Friedman's Career Opportunities in Biotech and Drug Development. Um, Toby does not pay me. I do not endorse her as an nih -er, um, but I do know that it's a very good book. A lot of you also ask me, Lori, how much money am I gonna make? Um, this is specifically for research and development. I didn't do the rest of them, but this is um, AstraZeneca, which is located here in the Bethesda area. This was updated just last week. Um, so for those of you who have a PhD, scientist one, scientist, you're probably coming in as a scientist one. This is approximately where you are. It's about $105,000 to $110,000. One of the hard things about industry jobs is from company to company to company, you have no idea what a scientist one is. It is different in every company. You just have to do your data research project to figure out what Pfizer calls it versus AstraZeneca versus Genentech or whatever. Recruiters, hiring managers are looking for people to do these 14 things. You will notice on this, on this list that the one thing that's not on here is science skills. 
they're they, they expect you to have those science skills, those research skills. These 14 things are what they're hiring you on. Um, so these are, you have to find ways to prove that you can do all of these 14 things. Finding a job, watch for people who have money and cash infusions, fears, bio, life science, uh, VC, venture capitalist. Um, look for companies that do R&D projects that interest you. So you can look through PubMed, Google Patent. A couple of years ago, I had somebody who wanted to go into antifungal research. Yay, go her. Um, I don't know who does antifungal. So we used Google Patent and we found an amazing number of companies that we would never have found. Also, anytime you go to a conference, a research scientific conference, look for anybody who's in industry and see if you can connect with them. Even if their science isn't something that you're really interested in, it's a great way for you to make industry-based connections. Um, you could also identify companies in an area using, uh, go to Google and type in uh, your favorite state biotech association. So New York Biotech Associations, NYBA. Um, Connecticut, it's Connecticut Cheers. Uh, every single state has a biotech association. Uh, it's a great way to see what's available in that state. If you are interested actually in the DC area, I, I recommend BioBuzz, B-I-O-B-U-Z-Z. -Z. Um, BioBuzz East, it is the, they even have a map of all the local companies. You also need to build your network and also prepare your resume. Some industry myths as we kind of wrap up and I see an amazing number of questions. I'm never going to get all to, so I have to like do some of them in other ways. Industry doesn't do good science. Arr, absolutely not. Great science is, happens in industry. They put those drugs into me. Like I'm going to take that drug, that science better be wicked amazing. So industry does do very good science and very careful science. You're, a lot of people who have transitioned will tell me that the science is much more careful in industry because of all the um, checks and balances. You don't have any scientific freedom. They're going to tell me what to do. Well, kind of, not yes and no. You'll have a defined project goal. You will have to work on what the company wants you to work on because that's the way it works. But the reason they're hiring you is because you have the scientific skills to decide how to make that happen. So that's why they're hiring you. It's, it's gonna look a lot like what you're already doing. Your project, you can come in on Monday morning and your project is gone. <sighs> yes and no, um, priorities change and you will have to, but you likely will see that coming. Very few people in industry um, don't know that it's coming. Furthermore, some of them are like, yay, I get to change projects. That one wasn't even working. There's no job security. Yes and no. Um, once you have that first job, the next one's easier and easier and easier to get. Like, like you've been there a week and all of a sudden the recruiters are calling that weren't calling when you were a postdoc because that week's worth of um, experience makes you so much more awesome, right? Um, but uh, right now, job security is amazing amazing. Like right now, it's never been better. We'll talk about that this afternoon in the hiring trends section. So here's a lot of um, resources for you to be able to successfully get into industry, how to apply, how to write your resumes, um, how to interview, how to write a cover letter, etc. cetera, um, on our careers playlist on YouTube. And remember, these slides are on, um, on Whova. Uh, we did interviews with whole bunches of people in industry environments uh, from 2020. They're great. They're amazing. They're all on our YouTube page. Our blog has a lot of things. And we also do recommend that you connect with your own local grad or postdoc office. I also wanted to point out this particular website. Um, the, I hate that it's called this, but it has a historical world. If you want to go into finance, consulting, marketing, kind of those those adjacent types of jobs, not R&D. This has nothing to do with R&D. I do recommend this particular job board, the Dropout Club, um, and there's the website for it. It's one of the few places I have seen that posts a lot of those jobs in, a, in, in one area. So it's not just like indeed.com that's so -ah, huge. Tons of other stuff on industry for you to click through and watch as you go through and lots of other resources on our website. So that is what I have um, on industry careers. Let's see what's in the Q&A. Dun, 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 dun. All right. Do you have to be a PhD to lead a team in industry? Absolutely not. 
um, there is a lot more mobility, even if you don't have a PhD. And in fact, I think on our, our, on our um, OITE YouTube page, there is, a, there is a session on what can you do without a PhD. So I recommend that. There's not as, um, it depends on the company too, but there are a lot more career progressions, even if you don't have the PhD. I don't know the answer about um, public service loan forgiveness. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know the answer for that. Are career opportunities in industry different if you decide not to produce a postdoc? Nope, not at all. Um, you can go and do any of these careers without a postdoc, absolutely. Ah, what about industry postdocs? Um, do they also have, they don't, industry postdocs are interesting. Some of them are very, very good and they do have the postdoc offices and they have the postdoc kind of community. I'm thinking like Novartis and Genentech. Others of them, um, don't have as much support. It really depends on the organization. That said, um, make sure you're doing your due diligence. If you do a postdoc in industry, make sure it's at the very, very front part of the R&D so you can still publish. Additionally, um, you will likely not get a job in that organization. Uh, very few, like they just don't hire from their, always hire from their postdoc organizations, but you do have that industry experience. You do not need an industry postdoc to get an industry job, um, but if that's something you're interested in, it's a great opportunity. All right, I think I answered that one. We talked about publications. Do you need connections to get interviewed? Not necessarily. I know lots of people who are public, who, who are getting getting things from recruiters or or applying through the online black hole of doom. Um, that said, uh, in industry, if you do have um, if you do have connections and a network, it does might put you into a different pile. Additionally, if you eventually get hired, they may get a kickback. Um, so don't ever feel bad in an industry environment for asking people to, to refer you um, because uh, they may get money for that. Uh, does it matter if the papers, if it's for four to five years, does it matter if they're in submission revision versus fully published? No, not at all, um, not at all. Don't overthink it. I think that's the big thing with publications, don't overthink it. Uh, you do not need significant experience, um, industry experience to get these jobs. Industry marketing, there, I think there are a couple of people today coming for industry marketing in the different things. Um, it's not as easy to hop into because you're competing with people who have marketing degrees who are in those, but definitely there are people, um, and you can search LinkedIn for people who do do industry marketing, who have the PhDs, and I would recommend reaching out to them. How do you search industry jobs based on a specific research field? Oh, that's interesting. I would look at conferences to see who is going to, which companies are going to different conferences that you're really interested in. Um, and then just the other thing, oh, I forgot to mention this. This is my favorite tip, my favorite tip for um, industry. Watch who's advertising, whether that's on social media, in your magazines, on TV, et cetera. You guys know, I mean, you get them all the time. What are they advertising? And what company is it? I always look to see what companies they are. And it may open your eyes to different companies and different things that are happening um, within the things. All right, I'm, I'm, uh, um, uh oh, I lost my spot. Oh, no, here I am, here I am. Uh, so leadership training, uh, I, there are no today, there is nobody from McKinsey or other, other consultings, not today. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't get anybody. Leadership trainings for people outside the NIH. We do do our workplace dynamics series. It is open to outside people. It will start back up in the fall. Um, as long as it's still online, you're more, welcome, more than welcome to come. What about somebody who's a little bit more seasoned? How can I get a job in industry? Absolutely. You should start networking. Um, I had somebody who was um, almost ready to retire and he decided to go into industry. Uh, he worked in the cancer immunotherapy field. He was a staff scientist at the NIH and it absolutely worked. Build your network, build your network because you're gonna want somebody to vouch for you from the inside. Oh, how early should you start looking? We'll talk about that this afternoon as well in the hiring trends, but it's about on average one month for every $10,000 you want to make, okay? One month for every $10,000 you want to make. 
So on average, most of you will be making $100,000. So on average, 10 months. But it can happen anytime. You can go longer, you can go shorter, but on average, we're seeing 10 months. And we'll talk about that this afternoon. Government jobs, I'm not going to talk about that today. Sorry. Um, we'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, and also on May 31st. On May 31st, which is a whole nother day, I know, but I'm having a whole talk on how uh, careers for, for, for P biomedical PhDs, et cetera, in the federal government and how do you get through usajobs.gov, May 31st. Project manager salary entry level. Uh, I ever, I don't remember what it was, but an entry level person, probably about $90,000 for entry level uh, project management that you should ask the speakers. And a great way to ask that is, what's the typical starting salary with someone coming into the field? Okay, we asked about the postdoc. Um, an industry postdoc is lower than a scientist one and scientist two. And an industry postdoc is temporary. Um, you will only stay there for probably three years before you have to find a real job. Um, a scientist, scientist one, scientist two is more permanent E. If you take a job elsewhere, grants management, so a non-bench job, and you wanna go back into industry as a non-bench, nope, that's cool, they'll take you. Um, yeah, non-bench to non-bench, totally fine. Non-bench and you're out for a couple of years ago and you wanna go back to the bench, it's more difficult. If you leave and go to any of these jobs that are um, uh, non-bench, sorry for those of you who are not um, uh, non-research, right? The research adjacent um, and you don't like it, that's fine. Go back within a year. You got a year to two years and you got to get back. Otherwise your science skills, like don't ask me to do a Western blot anymore. I can't, like it's too long. The slides are on Whova. Go ahead and download those. Um, regulatory affairs, how to become more competitive candidate. Um, you probably should do some coursework in regulatory affairs to understand the process of how drugs go to the FDA. Um, and make sure you go to the talk today um, on regulatory affairs that's this afternoon, both Fred and um, I can see her, starts with a J, but she went from the FDA to industry. So she, they both of them will have some really good advice there. Um, if you stay too long in academics, it's difficult to transition-ish, kind of. I'm not going to say that's 100% true, especially in the current job market. In the current job market, it's fine. Um, uh, you can stay longer than you probably could a couple of years ago, um, and you can get into industry. Uh, if I haven't decided between academic and industry and I'm in grad school, how do I do, what should I do to make myself have the most options? Oh, that's an interesting question. Make sure that you're building your network, you're talking to lots of people, and maybe taking a course on what the drug discovery process looks like. Ah, if I get rejected from a company from an interview, does that mean I can never apply again? Nope, just that job. You don't know who was in the pool, you don't know how competitive the other candidates were, but absolutely, you should try, try, try again. Even if you're applying for two jobs at the same time, the organization is not smart enough likely, especially if it's a place like Pfizer, they're not smart enough to know um, that you've applied twice. Um, that dropout board, you just download the slides and you can find that uh, website. You can apply right away, even if you got rejected. Um, international candidates, it's challenging. We'll talk about that a little bit this afternoon. Um, you have to find the right companies that will sponsor you. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's much more difficult than if you were um, a, a permanent resident or citizen in the United States. But remember, industry is all over the world. Like we have speakers today, uh, Cosima's in Germany. Um, she, she works for, I think, Pfizer or Merck. Um, Gail is in France. She works for a small a, a startup company. And then Orsi, she works for Nikon in London, right? So go talk to these people and talk about options around the world too. Um, everyone can apply for positions at regular affairs. We'll talk about FDA positions tomorrow. I don't have time today to talk about government jobs. Um, how to find people in industry. Um, there's a whole day of them. <laughs> Right? I have looked through past career symposiums. All of your grad students' organizations and your postdoc organizations are bringing in these types of people. They all know people who have gone into industry. Um, use your network. Trust me, you, your network is bigger than you think it is. It's not a waste of time to take a postdoc for five years and then try to hit a company. 
Um, but if you want to go into industry, go as fast as you can. Go make some money. If you're moving to an area for a spouse's job, yeah, can you tell the recruiters in your cover letter? Nope, not yet. Wait till you get the interview. Um, you can tell them that you are dedicated to moving to that area. Um, absolutely. I would put that actually in the front, the first paragraph, you know, I'm, I'm moving to, to the area. I would also not put your address on your resume, just put your email address and your telephone number. Um, certifications, I don't know what either one of those are, so I don't know if they help or not. Um, differences between biotechs like Amgen and pharmaceuticals, not much anymore. They're about the same. And there's a great thread on the community boards about MBAs, go check it out. No, don't get one. It makes you doubly degreed and doubly less qualified. Um, is it a myth that if you leave academia for a bench job in industry, it will different come back to industry, uh, to academics? Not right now. Um, academics are, host, are, are bringing back faculty that have industry experience. Um, Yes. Ooh, so it's not as bad as it is, but most people get into industry, love it and never go back, right? That's the biggest thing. Um, if I do decide to do an industry postdoc, can I go back and get a faculty job? Absolutely. Um, Novartis's postdoc program actually has a 50-50 um, option um, for um, like 50% of their people stay in industry and 50% of their people become faculty. All right, we already talked about the salaries. That was a whole slide. We talked about industry to academic. We talked about transitions. Yep. Um, how to become a competitive candidate. I had a whole slide on that and finance company. Make sure you take some finance um, things. Make sure you understand, do a business 101, understand the drug discovery process. Oh no. If you go to a big company and you get rejected, you'll never be considered again. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And you just weren't considered for that particular op, um, position. I hate that you guys feel that way. Like there's like three or four of you who have said that. And that makes me sad because it's a it's an urban myth um, that just, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you feel that way. All right, we already talked about the, all the different options you can get after doing your postdoc. That's, all, that's the whole talk. <laughs> um, if you're a PharmD PhD, no, that's not doubly degreed. Um, that's not you know, doubly less qualified. Those are two different types of degrees. Um, and within the sciences. Oh, this is a good one. How should we strategize the breakout rooms? Pick three speakers that you know you want to speak with, okay? So just go through the list, pick three speakers and make sure you hit their rooms. Um, I do not know any project management boot camps at all. Um, for management courses, check with your local postdoc association or your local grad, grad, grad offices and see if there are anything that they have. I don't know anybody who does them one-offs. Um, uh, like some of you may try American Chemical Society used to have courses, but I'm unsure if they still do or not. Phew. Oh my gosh, there's still more. Um, most specialized roles such as field application scientists. Could you come back into your research job? I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure yet would be possible. Ask the speakers today, hop in and just ask them or um, drop a line. I know um, a few of the speakers have been very, very active in the community boards or you can direct message any of them. Summary of qualifications, is that necessary in a resume? Not necessary, absolutely not necessary. However, very good because it's, it's the fastest way for you to prove to them that you're the best candidate for the job. It has to be entirely driven towards the job ad. Um, international students, um, we'll talk about that this afternoon in hiring, in the hiring trends. We have a slide on that there. Self-taught skills are valued. Yeah, sure. Why not? Absolutely. Like the, the program management things you did outside. Um, we'll talk about growth in industry. Oh, uh, no, this is different. You want to transition from scientists to senior scientists. Is it an easy transition? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the organization, the, if you show promise within that scientist one position, the company will invest in you to move you up into the ranks. Oh my gosh, my cat's feeder just went off and he's like going crazy. Um, artistic creative side, um, try marketing. Management training positions in R&D make it more difficult to go back to the bench. I'm not sure what that means. All right. Why doubly less qualified? Because you have no experience in industry and you have um, two degrees that make you very expensive. It's very expensive. You make, you're expensive. Okay. 
Uh, no, I do not have any resumes. Resume, please watch the resume thing. One to two pages is crazy for those of you who have PhDs. Um, it's near to impossible to get it that, that short. Don't worry about it. Just make it clear and concise. All right, friends, I know that there's still some here, but we want, I want to make sure you have enough time to take a stretch break. Um, and I wanna make sure that I can get over to the other session to start organizing um, that one. So I appreciate all these questions. We will hold on to them. If I didn't get to them, um, Alexis and I will make sure that we answer them. Either I'll do it directly to you um, or I will um, connect with you. You can drop me a message um, on the Whova app and I'll get to it later today or later on tomorrow. I really appreciate you coming for this one. I hope to see all of you or many of you at the rest of the day. Um, and with that, um, I will let you go and I hope you enjoy the rest of the career symposium. Bye everybody.